Welcome to Ecstatic Yoga. So happy you are here. I am Grace. This is Fundamentals of a Yoga Pose. And we are in EY Asana Lessons. The Fundamentals of a Yoga Pose. We're going to go through eight separate elements. Benefits. Contraindications. Modifications and variations. The foundation of the pose the alignment of the pose, the intention of the pose, the steps to getting into the pose, and then our counterposing. So let's begin. We will break down each yoga pose into these eight elements. Each element has important information on the yoga pose to assist students to find ease in going into and holding the poses. When all eight elements are put together, they can assist in mastery in practicing the, the asana poses. And we will go into more detail of each of the eight elements to help you understand um, in this class and then even more depth in some of our deeper classes. So let's begin with the benefits. Yoga in general has many benefits. And each individual pose has its own unique set of benefits. Some general benefits of yoga is a deeper sense of peace and a quieter mind more positive body image, a more loving connection to the body, overall health and well-being, increased flexibility, strength, and balance, improved breathing, which has many benefits, including better lung functioning, um, triggering the relaxation response, within the body, the nervous system, um, staying out of that fight or flight response where the cortisol and stress hormones are released, causing disease. We want to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system, which breathing and asana does, which releases those health-building hormones, like serotonin, naturally into the body creating healing. And these benefits are with the asanas, with the pranayam, with meditation practices, mindfulness practices. They all have these same benefits, even samadhi, especially samadhi and relaxation. And so with every pose, there are benefits simply to move the body and to center the attention and awareness into the body offers benefits beyond measure. In our analytics directory, we list the benefits to each individual yoga pose. We're not going to go into that each pose today. And in this 200 hour training, the analytics will cover the general physical benefits. And in our 300, we'll be going into more of the energetic, the energy body, uh, benefits to the chakras and the meridians and lots of really fun things. And um, so benefits vary from pose to pose because each pose will target different areas of the body. For example, an inverted pose will allow blood to naturally and easily flow to the brain, uh, relieving the veins, uh, that hard work to pump the blood up. So if your legs are lifted up and um, the blood, the veins are getting a nice little vacation, they're not having to pump that blood towards the heart, back to the heart. 
and it's naturally flowing towards the heart. Twists add benefit, have benefits. They bring blood flow into the spinal column, and they also bring blood flow into the internal organs. They detoxify and revitalize the internal organs. It's kind of like twisting a rag. You twist all that water out, detoxify, and then bring it back in and let it absorb fresh water. It's great for the organs. Back bends, they, they have the great benefit of strengthening our back. As we lift up in a cobra on a bridge, we are strengthening our back muscles. They can also relieve low back pain, back bends. So I'll list a few benefits, um, again, of yoga generally, deeper sense of peace, quieter mind, a more positive body image and loving connection to the body, improved flexibility, strength, balance, endurance, improved breathing, improved lung functioning, and triggering that relaxation response. Pranayama, there's benefits to pranayama. Pranayama is a powerful tool in working with the prana, the breath, the energy in the body. Um, and this brings vibrant health to the body, uh, energetically balances the entire body. And it helps mentally, physically, energetically, and spiritually to use breath work. And when these more subtle bodies, um, are radiantly healthy, the subtle bodies all around us and in us, the meridians, the chakras, the veyas, the eye, the um, nadis, when they become vibrant, then the result is that the physical body becomes radiant and vibrant because illness always starts out in the energy field first. And if we can keep the energy field really um, healthy and balanced and radiant, the physical body naturally will be also radiant and healthy. Some benefits of pranayam is it relieves stress, it can relieve anxiety and depression with regular practiced pranayam. Um, increases focus and attention, calms the nervous system and triggers that relaxation response improves oxygen and blood flow into the brain, into all the cells of the body. Also improves lymph circulation in the body, keeping the body clean. It can help prevent heart-related issues, uh, can relieve hypertension, uh, can also relieve asthma, can help reduce and relieve headaches and migraines. And it can also restore and help neurological issues. And so um, we have an uh, EY asana pranayama lesson that will go into more depth, including the benefits physically, emotionally, biochemically, the endocrine system, meridians and nervous system of the pranayama. And so another... Um, conversation about the benefits of yoga is the conversation of playing the edge in yoga. And where is my rubber band? I have it right here. Here it is. So I'm going to use a rubber band for an example with playing the edge. You'll always remember this. So practicing off asana offers Benefits to the body and stretching the body and increasing flexibility, strength, and overall body wellness, um, and increasing endurance, improving balance. We receive these benefits from both the movements of the asana poses, the pranayama practice, breathing, as well as allowing the body to integrate these energies into the body during our savasana or our relaxation poses. And um, we can all agree that we couldn't get these benefits, these great benefits by sitting on the couch, eating a bag of potato chips, watching TV. 
And we gain these benefits by challenging the body to some degree in a way that is beneficial that we call playing the edge. So I love to use this little rubber band to describe the edge. So if we're sitting on the couch, the couch potato, and we're eating potato chips, we're the loose rubber band. We're not getting many benefits in the body. We're just kind of loosey goosey. We watch it. And then and that has its time and its place as well. But if we go to our yoga practice and we don't challenge ourselves at all, and we just maybe lay in Savasana the whole time or sit in easy pose or don't put any effort into any of the poses, we're not going to get the best benefit. We're going to be like the loose rubber band. And then on the other hand, if we force the body, which over challenge the body. Always hate to do this one. We stretch the body so far that we could snap rubber band or snap a muscle or pull a muscle or a ligament or a tendon. That is not going to, that's over strain and that can uh, strain ligaments, it can exhaust the body and it can cause more harm than good. That's not the way we want to, to approach our yoga practice for the best benefits. So what we want to do is we want to play the edge. So we want to stretch that rubber band just enough to feel some tension. We're not loosey-goosey, we're not like that. With the safety of knowing it will not snap, we can challenge the body just enough to create some benefit. So over time, we get stronger, we get more flexible, flexible, or improve our balance, our endurance. We're able to move deeper into poses, move easier in our body. When we get along in age, our body is the same as when we were in our 20s. So this is the middle way right here. Playing the edge, challenging yourself a little bit, not overdoing it and forcing and striving. That's not what yoga is about. And it's not also not our time when we just, there are times for relaxation. But if we want the benefits of yoga, all those benefits, the energy systems, the glands, the muscles, the bones, we've got to play the edge a little bit. That's our middle way where the best benefits can be gained. And this is the natural place between the loosey goosey and um, the overextending um, and where we could pull or strain or exhaust the body. It's a relaxed stretching that also invites us to stretch in other areas of our life. So yoga is not only going to have us stretch a little bit in our bodies and play that edge, whether it's taking one extra breath, whether it's feeling the muscles and, and holding the pose um, or widening our stance a little bit so that we can feel a little more uh, effort um, or going in a little deeper into the forward fold where we can feel some sensation in the legs. We're just feeling it just that middle way, not, not no pain. Um, but also yoga invites us to stretch out of our comfort zone in trying new things, trying new ways to look at things, new perspectives, opening up to letting go of attachments and positions to um, beliefs that we might be so clinging to that we're right and that are true, opening up our minds a little bit like a parachute so that maybe we can accept more expanded ways of looking at things and letting go of those positional ways of thinking or those attached ways of being and um, no longer uh, getting upset about um, defending our positions and needing to be right, letting some of that go. So it also can invite us to stretch in those emotional areas, those mental areas. Is there another benefit to yoga? So the second um, is contraindications. 
So with every um, pose, there may be some contraindications. If you're in easy pose or savasana in child's pose, there's not many contraindications, but some of the more challenging pose, there are some contraindications, meaning we, we, we suggest um, movements that with certain conditions, injuries or limitations, maybe surgeries um, that, that in the body, that the body's experiencing, that um, this pose may cause more harm than good and more stress in the body than benefit. And therefore the pose needs to be either avoided or we would create some modifications and variations to the pose. So that's what a contraindication is. Pregnancy is one of the contraindications. It's always cautious throughout all the poses. It's okay to do yoga when you're pregnant, especially if you were doing yoga prior to pregnancy. Um, but you have to listen, consult your doctor. It's um, if you've never done yoga, definitely consult your doctor, your healthcare professional. Um, and as you get later into pregnancy, there's a lot of poses that are um, contraindicated for pregnancy. And it is always best to be safe. So it is important to know the contraindications of each pose. Um, however, and that will be covered in the analytics as well. So we won't be going over every pose today. We'll go, go over some general, out, general, general rules. Um, but as a yoga instructor, um, you be teaching a class full of students, you won't be able to have time to list every contraindication of each pose you're going through. And that wouldn't um, create a very meditative um, asana flow for people. Therefore, having a basic knowledge of contraindications, observing your students and if there is time, asking your students before class if they have any recent surgeries or injuries is helpful. And then you can suggest some certain modifications or variations for them. So a few general, general principles. Um, if a student has weak back muscles, they'll benefit from gentle back bending poses because the benefit of back bending is to build strength in the back. However, if they've had recent surgery on their back or their neck, you will suggest they avoid all back bending and neck related poses, especially back bending poses that go deep like bridge or camel. Um, however, you could offer modification for their back and one would be to put a small blanket underneath their back. So if everybody is going into bridge and going into a nice deep back bend, you could have them just lay on the floor and have just a small blanket, maybe folded over once right underneath the small of their back. Um, and this would cause no harm. And it would the benefits would be just releasing some of that pressure off their back, creating a little bit of gentle, um, flexion, uh, extension of the spine, um, which keeps the spine moving. And practicing flexion and extension of the spine gently will offer benefits and rejuvenate the entire spinal column, including the low back area. Any injury on in the legs, you'll suggest they avoid any poses involving weight bearing on the legs or poses that involve a lot of leg strength until they are sufficiently healed. With some minor injuries or limitations, you can suggest and offer some variations and limitations. Any neck injuries, avoiding anything where they're moving their neck. And be very careful with um, any injuries. And if they're telling you you have, inju they have injuries, I would always have you protect yourself and have them consult their healthcare advisor. Um, and, and also, of course, as we'll go into in a minute, make sure they all sign a release that they're doing this under their own risk. 
So some other limiting conditions, pregnancy, as we had mentioned, um, some severe asthma or heart conditions, seizure disorders, extremely low or high blood pressure, any form of violence um, is recommended that if they're in a violent state, not to go. Any surgeries or recent inj injury, recent surgeries or injuries. Um, let's see, each individual is unique and under unique circumstances. And ultimately, they are responsible for what is best for, and highest for their body. However, we as guides invite them to use caution and to consult with their healthcare professional. So with contraindications, there are some simple adjustments you can offer with changing body position or adding a prop, like a block or blanket. It can assist students to more easily enter into and hold a pose um, without strain on the body. A simple adjustment is for people who are not comfortable in easy pose. You can put a cushion underneath both knees and they can sit more comfortably in this pose. And in time, they may find that they need smaller and smaller cushions under their knees for support until one day they may not need any cushion at all. And they realize after a year that they forgot their cushion. And they laugh joyously at the memory of when they have these big cushions under their knees. Or maybe they will always enjoy feeling the support of a cushion under their knees. And that will bring them comfort and joy. And it will become a, a lifelong practice for their body. Everyone's body is different. And in our analytics classes, um, in our directory online, we include modification and adjustments for each pose. It's always important to advise your students to be responsible for their own bodies in practicing yoga. Remind them that they are um, that you you are not a medical advisor. You are a yoga teacher, and if they have any questions or concerns, to consult their medical health care advisor or doctor. Always advise that your students never enter into pain during their yoga practice. And if they do enter into pain, to immediately release themselves from the pose carefully, or just decline going into a posture or a pose that may cause unnecessary stress in their body. Invite them to stop the pose at any time during the practice of your class for any reason, if needed, any reason. They always have permission to simply go into a child's pose, a seated pose, relaxation pose, any relaxation pose. Um, and you can remind them that it is their class. And so if they need to rest, that's perfectly okay. Um, you can hope that they would be respectful and quiet if they decline a pose, if they could just quietly sit in easy pose or child's pose. And um, if, if they feel their body needs to rest a little longer or their body needs to stay in a pose a little longer, that the invitation is there as well. And um, they can always come into relaxation pose, child's pose, or seated pose, or any restorative pose at any time. When working in a yoga studio or your own studio, um, you will always need to have students sign a release to hold you harmless as an instructor and Hold the studio harmless and school harmless and make sure that it states that the students are practicing at their own risk and taking responsibility for their own bodies. And you can find more information in our business section with releases. 
Also, whether students have injuries, physical limitations, whether they're pregnant or undergone recent surgery, it is always advised to invite students to never force a pose. Remind them in every class that yoga is about allowing the body to open, not about forcing and striving. Invite them to play the edge, staying in the feel good stretch, never going into the overstretching or pain in any pose. Yoga is not about experiencing pain in the body. This is the messenger to back off from the pose. Always inviting students once again to have the freedom to enter into easy pose or relaxation pose if any they begin to experience pain back off from the pose. Any type of overstress or pain um, to invite them to rest and get out of the pose and that they can get out of any pose at any time for any reason. They are free in this class. Um, listening to their bodies and communicating with their own inner selves. We encourage honoring the body in ecstatic yoga. That, will, that we all have the innate wisdom and intelligence within each and every one of us, within our body, to listen to the body. And this way we can live in vibrant health. So our next is modifications, variations. And often due to injuries, um, physical limitations, varying body types, or um, varying skill levels, modifications and variations of poses are very helpful and needed. It is important to note that everyone is different, very different. Every body type is different. And it is very wise to never compare or judge yourself or your body or your capabilities with another student. Remembering as you go through your practice, the ultimate intention of yoga is to yoke, to become one. It is to quiet the disturbances of your mind so completely that you simply know yourself as that equanimous witnessing, that observer, asking deeper and deeper with the divine of your understanding, to come closer to the soul, the inner being, the infinite self. Asana practices were created long after yoga began and as a means to help students quiet their minds just enough so they could come into sacred embodiment, so they could attain that state of meditation, quiet, silent stillness of the mind. So they could enter into that expanded awareness that is knowing and experiencing of their own being, their expanded mind, which is one with and part of the Atman, Brahm, universal mind, God of your understanding, creator, source of this existence here now, and of your existence, sustainer of this awareness that you are aware of now, in this present moment. So with that said, we don't compare, but there are differences. And in the body, uh, more muscular body types sometimes have a little bit harder time being more flexible. They might not be able to go as deep into a forward fold, per se. And um, they might not have the level of flexibility as those who are less muscular. However, having a muscular build and working out is a good thing. Uh, being fit is a good thing. And I often tell the men and women in my classes that come in and are muscular and might be a little frustrated because they can't reach their toes. They're not as flexible as everyone else. 
that um, they're simply muscular. And all that wonderful muscle is not is what is not allowing them to be quite as flexible. So don't compare yourself and be grateful for your body type, whatever that is. Everyone is different. Remembering the ultimate goal is not to become a pretzel, but it is to become one with that inner guru, that inner life force, vitality that sources you from moment to moment. And those muscular people, they are the yogis who um, can't bring, may not be able to bring themselves into a pretzel, but we might need their strength someday to save our lives. Or maybe they can move us out of our homes when we need someone to carry all those heavy boxes. So we all have our gifts. And thank God they're all different. That's what makes the world go around. So modifications, most poses have a few modifications um, that they offer and modifications usually assist um, so that the person can get into the pose with some limitations or if they're beginners and they haven't practiced before, they, their body isn't stretched enough, they can still get into the poses. Um, for example, using a block to bring the earth up a little or going into a forward fold and it can accommodate um, that stretch. Um, and using a bolster or a blanket can add support and create more restorative aspects of a, po a pose. Um, some props for modification would be a yoga block, um, a bolster, or straps you can use for some forward folds and things, um, blankets, can use as modifications. Eye pillows are always nice. You can use a wall, especially in some balancing poses, um, or a chair, a meditation cushion, or some gripped socks. Those are some props. So let's talk about variations um, as well. Variations of poses offer either more ease or they can offer more challenge to the pose. In the case of more ease or assisting with physical limitations, variations can help students get into the poses safely, even with some limitations. Props as well as creative variations offer someone who otherwise couldn't go into a pose, or at least not comfortably, to participate and receive the benefits of a yoga class. Examples of variations um, for limitations are adjusting the width of your stance by narrowing it a little bit or dropping down to your knee in lunge or warrior one, adding a prop to bring the earth higher in a forward fold, a block, so to say. Um, in a balancing pose, you can lean up against the wall. And for examples for using variations for more challenging, to make it challenger, more challenging, uh, you can widen the stance. Uh, you can go deeper into a squat, like when you're in goddess squat, you can go way down into that squat and make it a little more challenging. Um, when you're in forward fold, you can grab the elbows, or bring them behind the calves to increase the stretch creates a little variation to make more challenging. You can hold your feet in bow to deepen the back bend. Um, so these are ways we can deepen and challenge through variations. Um, other modifications, adjustments, and variations allows offering these modifications, adjustments, and variations allows you to teach a class with a diverse range of experience and skill. You may have students from varying levels of skill from beginner to more advanced in one same class. Everyone will feel honored and able to participate with just a few simple modifications or variations. 
After all, we are all very different. And that is a very good thing. So foundation. Now we are getting into the technical aspects of the fundamentals of a yoga pose. So the very first thing we want to set before we move into any other parts of our pose is our foundation. This is where our body is connected to the earth. With a mat, if we have a mat. And this is where we're grounding our physical body into Mother Earth. And we bring our focus and set that foundation first when entering into any yoga pose. And this is just like building a house. First thing we do is we set the foundation of the house first. And if we build the house on a strong foundation, that house could still be standing hundreds of years later. So once the foundation is solid and stable, then we can move into the other elements of the pose, setting the alignment and the intention. But if the foundation isn't stable or correct, it can throw off the entire pose. And, then the and when the foundation is stable, it allows for ease and grace in the pose. So we are... Um, with each pose, the foundation will be different. Every pose, it'll be a little bit different. In standing poses, the foundations will be mostly the feet and the hands. Floor poses can also be the feet and the hands, yet it could be simply just the sits bones or the sacrum. Like when you're in boat or balancing beer. When entering into a yoga pose yourself, and your students into the pose by setting the foundation first, bring awareness to what parts of your body are connected to the earth. Giving the gratitude to the support of the earth, supporting your body and supporting that pose. This grounds the student in the pose, connects the student to mother earth, and brings a sense of support and safety to each pose. Once we've set our foundation, we're ready to move into our next element, which is alignment. Alignment is another technical aspect of getting into a pose. With each pose, there are alignment principles. And we will go into the basics in this 200-hour course course in more depth in our 300 hour course. It is important to be in proper alignment when going into and holding your yoga pose. Alignment not only, not only allows the pose um, to provide the benefits, but also supports safety and strength of the body while holding your yoga pose. For example, if we align the knee so it is directly over the ankle while we're in warrior one, it is important because if the knee goes forward of the ankle, that can put stress on our knee and strain on the knee. Also having the feet and knees hip width apart when we're in our bridge um, creates activation. Whereas if we allow those knees to flop out and be lazy, the knees won't create the same strengthening benefits for the back. Proper alignment not only supports the pose, the body, and it avoids injury. It also allows for benefits of the pose to be available to the student. And it also looks better when you're in alignment. So mountain, our Tadasana pose, can offer a great model to mirror onto other poses for the principles of alignment with the, the Anusara loops by John Friend. There's seven organic loops with the 
Tadasana Mountain Pose. And this alignment can not only help you, you can use these loops in other poses other than Tadasana. It also helps, will help you with your posture. And as you engage these loops and you practice them in mountain and you bring them forth in your daily life as you walk around and you stand and you're mindful of these loops, the gravity will have less negative effect on you. It won't hunt you over as you get old because you'll be maintaining the proper alignment principles in your Tadasana mountain posture. So let's go over those loops in the mountain Tadasana pose. Our first loop is ankle loop. And that starts at the base of the shin bone, just above the ankle, moves down the back of the heel, forward along the bottom of the foot, then back up through the center of the arch to the front of the shin base. This loop lifts the arch of the foot. Our next loop is the shin loop. Starts at the base of the shin bone, just above the ankle, moves up the back of the calf muscle to the top of the calf and the back of the knee. It moves forward through the top of the shin and then moves down the front of the shin, back to the base of the ankle. And this loop engages our calf muscles. The next is thigh loop. It starts at the top of the femur in the core of the pelvis. It moves down the back leg to the top of the calf muscle, forward through the knee, then up the front of the thigh through the lower pelvis. And this lifts the knees and engages the quadriceps. Our next is pelvic loop starts in the core of the abdomen in line with the lumbar in the place just below the navel. It moves down from the middle lumbar to the base of the sacrum, forward through the floor of the pelvis to the top of the pubic bone, then up the lower abdomen just below the navel. And this brings our pelvis to neutral. You'll have a visual of this, so you don't need to memorize. I have it all written out. It's like to go through in this class. Kidney loop starts in the core of the abdomen in line with the middle lumbar and a place just below the navel. It moves up the back just below the kidneys to the bottom of the shoulder blades. Forward through the top of the diagram to the base of the sternum and down the solar plexus just below the navel. And this lifts the upper back. Shoulder loop, one of my favorites. Pelvic loop, bringing that pelvis to neutral and shoulder loop. Starts at the upper palate and it moves down the back of the neck. So it's gonna come back, shoulders are gonna come back. It's gonna go down the back of the neck bottom of the shoulder blades. Then it's going to come forward through the heart, up to the top of the diaphragm, then up the chest and throat from the base of the sternum to the upper palate. Brings the chin level to the floor, lifts the chest a little bit, shoulders are going to go down and back. And the skull loop starts at the upper palate, moves back up the back of the skull, forward over the top of the head, and then down back to the upper palate. And this lifts the skull to the sky and lengthens the spine. So now that's a beautiful way to use our, um, our alignment principles, keeping the body in perfect alignment as we move through our poses. And our next is intention, the next element. Intention is also sometimes referred to in ecstatic yoga as lines of energy or engagements. Intention is the art of generating energy 
through the body. There is a subtle yet clear difference between alignment and intention in a yoga pose. For example, in down dog, the alignment may be straight legs with soft knees, bringing the body into an upside down V shape. However, if we add intention, we would add to lift the tail to the sky, to engage the thighs, bringing them back away from the arms. Or in our five pointed star, the alignment would be wide, straight legs, soft knees, outstretched arms. However, the intention with our five pointed star would be engaging five simultaneous lines of energy, sourcing all from the solar plexus. Two lines of energy would be going down both legs into the feet and into the earth. And then you'd have two more lines coming up from the core, out both arms and fingertips. And then our fifth line of energy would be coming up the body, out the crown of the head, reaching to the sky. So in each pose after alignment is created, it is very beneficial to bring awareness to the engagement and these intentional lines of energy the pose offers the body. This will deepen the pose greatly and add more benefit physically and energetically. Many yoga instructors may not mention or talk about the lines of energy during the yoga class. However, to invite the students to become aware of the option to engage these lines of energies will add benefit mentally, mental focus, physically, energetically, physically for strength, and energetically and subtly for the energy bodies. In the beginning, a new student may not be able to focus on all these elements of yoga pose and intention would be after you set the foundation and you create the alignment. It may be a lot to focus on in the very beginning and a last important step after making sure the physical body is grounded and in the correct foundation and aligned for the best support and safety of the body. Once foundation and alignment are created, Take the time to bring awareness to the energies of the pose. Focus your attention on the flow of energy or the lines of energy intentionally. And this will empower the pose. And it will be a beautiful way to master manifesting lines of energy in not only the yoga poses, but in your life. So if a student is in mountain or tadasana pose, they can be standing up straight and looking fine in perfect alignment. The foundation is set just right. Their feet are hip width apart. They've used their two fists between their feet and they're in perfect foundation and alignment. Then to add these intentional loops into the pose and all the intentions of tadasana, you will be holding a completely different mountain pose. A relaxed standing mountain will feel completely different than when you are holding these loops and these intentions, engaging engagements, engaging the calves, the shin loop, engaging the quadriceps, feeling the lift of the knees and the quads engage, the pelvic loop, bringing the pelvis into neutral. Um, engaging the abdominal loop and lift of feeling a lift of the ribs, the chest, the chin parallel to the floor, the shoulders back and down, the skull reaching up. The student will gain a lot more out of the pose physically, emotionally, mentally, and energetically while engaging the intentions of the pose. 
Most yoga postures do not have as many intentions and lines of energies as mountain or tadasana or even five-pointed star. However, there is a theme with many of the poses I'd like to go over that can help you remember the intentions of many of the poses. So yin poses, the energy sources and begins at the heart. And more yang poses, more warrior type poses. Warrior, we are the energy sources more from the solar plexus. Energy often moves from the source out to the extended extremities. And uh, let's see. And poses that are forward folding, like forward fold or child's pose, pyramid. The intention is to bring the energy inward. Those are a few general, general, generals. We'll go over all the intentions of different sequences and flows, but I wanted to go over the warrior just to give you a little example. So we start in warrior two. The energy is going to source from the solar plexus, and it is going to be going out to the extended front fingertips. Both arms will be out, but you'll be looking out the front fingertips. That's where the intention will go. Reverse warrior, so this becomes more yang, is going to be from the heart up out the extended fingertips. Side angle is going to be from the back foot along the whole side body and out the extended fingertips. Triangle is more yin. And that will be from the heart and out the extended fingertips. Reverse triangle is the same. It's from the heart and out the extended fingertips. Pyramid is a forward fold, so it has an inward intention, going in to the south, reflective, inwardly reflective. Star is yang. We talked about this. And that is all coming from the solar plexus, the heart area, out all five lines of energy, both legs and feet, both arms and fingertips, and straight up and out the crown. Goddess is more yin, so that is coming from the heart, and it will come out through the palms, the hands. So we're handing our palms in if we need to go in or out. Wide leg forward fold is a forward fold, so the intention is more inward. And I'll go through sun salutation as well, just to give you an idea. A mountain will engage all those loops in the body we talked about. Forward fold is going to be an inward intention. Lunge is more yang. It's coming from the solar plexus and out the extended front fingertips where your gaze is at. Down dog. Tail is to the sky. Thigh is engaged and coming back. And you're bringing your focus inward. Up dog or cobra is more yang, and it is from the um, solar plexus up and out the heart. So including intention in your yoga poses adds an element of focus that deepens the pose, adds more energetic benefit that empowers the pose and the student. And as you practice including intention in your yoga practices while holding the poses, you're also practicing mastering your energy so you can create intentions in your life. Maybe you're creating an intention to learn a sport or manifest a perfect job or a perfect relationship. You are more masterful now with your energy and can focus your attention in your life on and off the mat to manifest those things you want to manifest with ease and with grace. So our next element is steps. We take steps to get into every yoga pose. And the first thing is you will always begin with a starting position. Now that will vary depending on where the pose is in the flow. If you're just starting with a pose outside of a flow, it, the analytics has you start in a 
kind of a logical starting position, but it doesn't mean you always need to. So in a, in a flow, you'll be moving from pose to pose. So the starting position would be wherever you are when you got out of the previous pose. So um, we want to, we talked about this a little in choreographing, as you want to lead the, stu the students um, into poses that flow from one to the other. So um, you lead the students into the pose from the starting pose, and it's wise to create a flow that, um, a class that flows from pose to pose. So an example would be sun salutation. You can very easily move from each pose in a very flowing manner. Mountain to forward fold, then you foot back to lunge, move one other foot back into down dog. It's very flowing. Now, if you're in a mountain and your next pose would be balancing bear, you'd need to move down to the floor. You'd need to sit on your sits bones and move and then move into the pose. It doesn't offer a flowing motion. It is a bit disruptive and certainly won't have offer an environment for meditation or stillness within the class. So do your best when choreography in your class to include sequences of poses that flow easily together from pose to pose. So each pose has steps and it's important to follow the steps and move step by step into your pose for safety and accuracy of the pose. For example, if you're going into bridge pose, you will certainly need to guide the students to bring their hips up, lifting the hips up before you guide them to bring their hands underneath their body. If you guided them to bring their hands under their body before you guided them to lift their hips, there would be nowhere to put the hands. Their body would be laying down on the floor. There would be no space. So steps of poses are very intuitive and make sense. Just like the bridge, lifting the pelvis and then coming up onto the shoulders and clasping the hands underneath because there's space now. You will not have a problem. And you can study the analytics on our analytics directory of the steps to getting into the poses. So the next element is bandhas and breath. First, let's talk about bringing in the breath. Some would say that breathing is the most important aspect of every yoga pose. To add deeper rhythmic breathing to the pose allows the energy of the pose to flow with prana and life force energy to move through the body, creating all those wonderful benefits of the asana. There are variations to breathing that can apply to poses, including breathing through your nose, breathing through the mouth, using the Ujjaya breath, as well as Kumbhaka breath retention for short intervals in certain poses. Using the breath consciously while holding a pose and moving through the flows of poses adds great benefits to the, your yoga class in the, each pose. Breath moves energy, releases emotional blocks, increases pranic flow and sensation within the body. We will go into more depth with pranayama and breath in our pranayama class and classes in the pranayama analytics. And for this class, it is just simply important to Always remember to cue your students and remind them to use their breath to keep conscious flow of deep rhythmic breathing throughout their class, throughout your class, in, in each pose. In ecstatic yoga, we often hold the pose for three breaths, a little bit deeper and longer than a natural breath. 
three is a magical number. It allows time for the body to deeply integrate the pose and allows time for several poses during a yoga flow. You have too many breaths, can't fit too many poses in. So it's kind of, an, again, a middle of the road. However, there will be times where you will only be in a, breath, a pose for one deep breath. Three breaths is definitely not a rule. It's just a general, um, a general um, invitation to hold the breath um, for three breaths, to hold the pose for three breaths in many of the poses. So let's go on to engaging the bondas. We've had our, our bondas classes, but um, we'll review a little bit. And um, so at this point, you've set the foundation, your feet or your hands or your sits bones or your backs of your thighs are connected to the earth. We are aware and we have moved the body into the proper alignment. And we're focusing on the intention of the pose and we're breathing deeply and consciously moving the prana and energy through the body. And we're gonna ask one more thing for you to focus on. One more thing to hold simultaneously while you're focused in your pose. And that is to engage the bondage. At first, this will seem like a lot to, con to bring your concentration into. However, as you practice, all these elements will become natural. Your body will gain muscle memory. You'll be doing it automatically, just like driving down the road, turning the radio, putting the blinkers on. So do you remember the first time you drove a car? I remember. And I remember my sister was older than me and she knew how to drive a car before me. And she was my helper driving the car. So she would drive and she'd look in the mirror and her hair, she'd change the radio stations, she'd, she'd be able to multitask. And I remember the first couple of times driving the car and I was had my hands gripped on the wheel and I was not going to focus on anything. She had mentioned change the channel. I couldn't even imagine bringing my hand down and looking down and changing the radio channel. I have a single focus on holding the wheel. Now, after a week or two of driving, yes, I too could change the channels on the car and multitask and put the blinkers on and hopefully not be looking in the mirror doing too much. But um, uh, so anyways, um, it was very quickly I was able to get that. And that is the same way it is with your yoga. So it might seem like a lot in the beginning focus on the foundation, the alignment, the intention, each step, and then the breath and the bondos. But just like driving a car, it's going to become very natural for you. All right. And um, when you learn to include all these elements of a yoga pose, including engaging the bondos, you will intensify the results both physically, energetically in the body. And that will be all in the same one hour practice. So you could do a one hour practice and you could maybe not be holding the intention or not engage in the engagements or the bondas or the breath, but you won't get the same amount of benefit. So you'll get a lot more benefit in the same amount of time by including all these fundamentals of a yoga pose. Bandhas are energy locks within the body that seal the energy inside the physical body. They activate the nadis within the body and especially that shashumna, a great river nadi that moves up the central core, wakens the kundalini. When we engage the bandhas during a yoga practice, we amplify the energy within the body by not allowing the energy to leak out while we're holding the poses. It stays in to rejuvenate and heal and intensify the energies within us. 
So the body, the energy is contained in the body. It intensifies and it activates the chakras, the nadis, to bring overall well-being and balance in the body, as well as raising the kundalini and activating spiritual awakening on a spiritual, physical, and energetic level. So it seems just a little to ask for such great benefit. As you begin to train your muscle memory to engage the bandhas while holding poses and relaxing in between and while setting up for poses, you will be in a position to remind your students to also engage their bandhas. So I want to give a quick review of the bandhas. I know we've had a class, but a review is always good. And this isn't to replace the class. Now, Mula Bandha is at our root chakra often called the root lock. Um, it involves, it's that Kegel muscles, those Kegel muscles that women are taught to engage after they have a baby or any kind of bladder issues. It involves perineum muscles, um, that space between your anus and your genitals. It's this muscle is the muscle you use when you hold from urinating. You really, really got to go. Um, it's also you, if you really want it, if you're really having trouble finding how to engage the Mula Bandha, um, and I don't advise this um, more than once or twice, and maybe not when you really have to go to the bathroom, but you can interrupt your stream of urination while you're going to the bathroom, and that is the muscles, that you know, same muscles you'll be engaging for the Mula Bandha. We're lifting up the pelvic floor. But don't do that too much because that can't be good to hold your urine. But just for an instant, if you're really needing to find out how to feel those muscles. Okay. When you engage the Mula Bandha, you engage the perineum muscles, bringing the energy up and in toward the second or sacral chakra. So it's an engagement of bringing it in and up. Women have been instructed to engage this muscle with Kegel exercises for childbirth. I had mentioned. The second bandha is the Uddiyana bandha. We move it up a little. And this is the diaphragm block located at the abdomen, engaging the second and third chakras. You're going to be engaging them both and engaging that abdomen and bringing the energy in and up towards the heart chakra. So you're going to bring the belly in and the energy is coming up towards the heart. And the third is the Jaranhala Bandha. This is the throat lock located at the throat chakra. And you engage this by bringing the chin in where it's just a little bit and resting the tongue on the roof of the mouth. Mala Bandha is when you engage all three bandhas simultaneously. Many poses will allow you to engage the mala bandha, all three bandhas. However, there will be times when a pose doesn't feel right to hold all the bandhas, and you may want to hold just one or two. Um, and there, those are naturally engaged. Um, when I'm in forward folds, I often don't hold the Uddiyana bandha, the belly. I will engage the Mula Bandha and the Jarmandala Bandha. And um, it just doesn't feel natural to engage the abdomen. But I know of some people who do when they're in their forward fold. I allow my, my Uddiyana Bandha to rest, my belly to rest. Listen to your body and your intuition. Do what feels right for you. The intent is to engage as many energy locks as possible um, with the natural flow of the body. So coming out of the pose. So we're still in our steps of the poses. Um, coming out of poses consciously and slowly is an important part of the pose. As important sometimes as getting into the pose. With coming out of poses, there is usually a very intuitive way to move out of the pose. However, some poses have specific steps to move out of the pose to protect the body. For example, in the bridge pose, 
the invitation is to slowly bring the hips down onto the floor one vertebrae at a time from the upper thoracic to the lower thoracic to the upper lumbar and lower lumbar. And then allow, once the back is flat on the floor, allow that sacrum and that tailbone to relax. We often guide like a string of pearls as you're coming down, one vertebrae at a time. And then it's always recommended. This will be our next element to counterpose with the knees to chest. So let's see, the hips down one vertebrae at a time. This protects the lower back and the spinal column and it also allows a little mini massage on the back as you're coming down one vertebrae at a time, which is a great benefit. Coming out of the pose also varies depending on what pose follows. As many poses transition directly into the next pose. So as we mentioned earlier, a benefit to creating a flowing sequence is to create flow from one pose to the other. So for example, if you are in down dog and your next pose is forward fold, you'll simply walk, step, or jump those feet to the front of the mat with the hands. And then if you're in downward dog and you're moving into chaturanga, in our sun salutation, both of them, you will lower your hips as you hinge into a plank position out of your down dog. So it depends on what pose you're going to in coming out of the pose as well. So our last thing we wanna talk about in the fundamentals of a yoga pose is counter posing. This is the last of the eight elements and it's, it's an also important aspect of the pose. Uh, counter poses is when you add an opposite movement to the pose, um, yet in a slighter way to release any tension built up during that pose. This is a neutralizing um, that protects the body as well as it also calms the nervous system. Counter posing not only helps the physical release, calms the nervous system, it also can add a cleansing of the toxins in the body. Um, as you create um, a pose over to the other side, or like for a backbend, creating a forward fold to neutralize the energy physically and energetically in the body. Counter poses are important, yet not necessary for every pose. The best sequences offer naturally that the next pose would be somewhat of a forward, of a, of a counter pose. Um, when we go into in sun salutation, we go into a little back bend, into our extended mountain, and then we come into our forward fold. We're naturally offering a counter pose through the sequencing of our flow. So there are some basic rules on counter posing, and this is also in more detail in the analytics directory. And let's start with flexion and extension of the spine. Back bends move the spine into extension and forward float folds move the spine into flexion. I remember this by forward fold flexion, FFF. So when you move the back into extension into a back bend, it is recommended to counterpose your back bends with some sort of flexion, um, some sort of forward folding in the body. So it could be different, like if you are in a standing position, maybe going into that mountain and you're going into a little back bend, you might naturally intuitively move your students into a forward fold. However, if you are bringing your students into a bridge pose. You're going into a nice deep back bend there or a wheel pose. 
um, it's even deeper back bend. Once they come out, a beautiful counter pose is bringing the knees to the chest. So we're creating flexion after that extension. So you wouldn't wanna bring people into bridge and have them stand up and do a forward fold. You would rather have them flow right into knees to chest and let them roll around a little bit to release and relax that lower back that was just an extension. So let's talk about twists. Twists are another type of pose that um, counterposing can be very beneficial, especially a deep twist. Um, and the best counterpose that I have known of is to do a very gentle, slight twist to the other side. After you've twisted to one side, deeply go to the other side, just a gentle twist. Then, of course, move in to the other side. Make sure and get both sides in your twist. But even if you've gone to the other side, after you go to one side, just do a gentle, slight, opposite twist to the other direction. It's a nice little counter pose to release the spine. And that can make a big difference for the spine. Then you can go to the other side. So another counter pose for Matsyasana or fish pose is the, um, is the fish pose is a great counter pose for the shoulder stand. Um, so right after your shoulder stand, you can guide your students into fish, Matsyasana. The fish pose will stretch those shoulders and cervical vertebrae to release any tension that may have been built up during their shoulder stand. Rabbit is a great counter pose for headstand. Child pose is a universal counter pose. You can use it any time during your practice to neutralize and bring your store to any pose, especially a yang a set of poses. Child pose is beautiful counter pose. So in closing, now you're educated on the fundamentals of the elements of moving into, holding, and moving out of a yoga pose. This knowledge will allow you to teach a yoga class, class with knowledge and experience for a safe, beneficial, and powerful yoga experience for all your students. Learning the analytics of the poses will reinforce this knowledge and that will allow you to be highly skilled to lead yoga students proficiently through your yoga classes. Thank you for joining me for Fundamentals of the Yoga Class. I'm Grace. You can go to Ecstatic Yoga studio for more information on our teacher trainings and retreats wishing you a most beautiful and most blessed day namaste